Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of our talk on small bowel obstruction. At the last uh, session, we spoke about uh, volvulus, we spoke about um, adhesions, we spoke about all sorts of things related to obstruction. One of the things we didn't speak about was the second most common cause of obstruction, which was hernias. And if you think about it, hernias were number one in the 1900s, but thank God, or thank goodness perhaps, it's number two and it happens infrequently. Now hernias, particularly strangulated hernias, are more common in older patients, so that's gonna be a challenge. The key is to recognize and detect early so intervention can be done before the patient gets ischemic bowel. Here's a good example. The patient has dilated small bowel loops and the question is why? Maybe it's adhesions, maybe it's a mass, but as you scan down, would you recognize, particularly in the coronal view, the transition point in the right lower quadrant? And then you see that's a loop of bowel, which is extending into an inguinal hernia. You can see it very nicely as you look at the 3D views. A key thing to me in terms of the seriousness of hernias, because we see lots of hernias, we'll just describe inguinal hernias, but here the bowel loop is thickened and also there's fluid within the hernia. To me, that's a sign of problems. It's a sign of impending ischemia. This is not a patient who will be reduced at the bedside. This patient will get surgery and will get a hernia repair and the patient will do fine. And if picked up early enough, there's no need for resection of bowel. Here's just the look at that, when you look at the axials, just a beautiful example how the bowel loop, it's enhancing, so it's inflamed, the fluid around it going right into this hernia sac. A very nice example right there. Another case, dilated small bowel, again the coronal makes it very easy to see the transition, and you follow it down to the right lower quadrant, and there's the transition. Thickened bowel, there's the hernia, trace fluid, that will need to get surgery, but the patient did fine. Again, the coronal views are particularly good at looking at transition points, and particularly for inguinal hernias, and for that matter, almost any hernia. The coronals and the 3D coronal views are particularly valuable in this regard. Also, the sagittal views nicely showing you the hernia here as well. So it does emphasize the point we made at the start of the talks that when you're looking at hernias, you're looking for transitions. Axials are good as a starter. Maybe you see the obstruction, but then coronals are critical and sagittals are critical also for helping define the hernia, but also for really giving you a good look at the SMA and celiac axis and make sure there's no problems going on there. Another patient suspected uh, bowel obstruction on plain films. You can see in the right lower quadrant the dilated bowel loops. There's a little bit of stranding present. And then you follow it down into this hernia. Again, a good example of where, when you go from axials to coronals, it's much more obvious. There's the thickened loop of bowel. There's the transition point. There's some of the induration present. And this is a classic hernia. A very nice example, again, showing you that on the coronal views. Now, external hernias are the second most frequent cause of small bowel obstruction. They can occur throughout the abdomen and pelvis, but most frequently involve the inguinal region or anterior abdominal wall. As we mentioned, the hallmark of small bowel obstruction due to hernia is the presence of dilated bowel up to the hernia sac, followed by decompressed bowel exiting from the sac. And that's exactly what I showed you in the last few cases. Now let's go forward and look a little bit more carefully. Another patient, patient presents with abdominal pain, suspected acute abdomen. You can see the stomach is well distended. We then keep scanning downward and you can see very nicely the dilated loops of bowel and then there is a hernia right through this defect in the abdominal wall in the left lower quadrant. There's some stranding there. There's some thickening of the bowel loop. And then as we look at it on the 3D or the routine coronal views, you can see how that bowel loop is just going through a defect in the left lower quadrant. Here it's very nicely shown on the sagittal view. Again, the thickened loop of bowel, the dilatation right to that loop, and then the uh, defect right there and the hernia. Here it is nicely again on the classic volume rendered views. And here it is on the cinematic views. You can see it almost looks like a knuckle. And 
when the patient is being examined by a really good uh, GI doc or a surgeon or internal medicine doc, they'll palpate a mass there, and it's this knot that's the hernia. Now, when you look at that hernia and you look at its location, it's not an inguinal hernia, it's a hernia through a defect in the lateral abdominal wall. Again, beautiful example of dilated bowel. There's the hernia, the thickened bowel. Here it is again. And that's called a spagelian hernia. Spagelian hernia is a very, very specific location and appearance. It's a rare type of ventral hernia, but not all that rare, which is defined as herniation of abdominal content or peritoneum through a defect, namely the spagelian fascia, which is comprised of the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique aponeurosis, so you can see why it's in that location. Patients can describe a painful or painless bulge, that's what we were showing on the cinematic, in their abdominal wall, particularly when standing, that may be acute or chronic. Depending on the contents contained within the hernia, pain may vary greatly in terms of severity, character, and location. Commonly, patients will present in the urgent setting secondary to complications related to that hernia. And here's another example of a hernia. This is a large defect in the left abdominal wall and a large amount of small bowel that's inflamed. You can see the mesenteric stranding. This is a classic example of a midline hernia. These commonly occur in patients who had prior surgery. The suture line will break down. There's a defect in the patient's rectus muscle. And you'll see this hernia of bowel. And you can see how this would protrude and how you would examine this with physical examination. Just a really nice example. Now, again, as I mentioned, this is a surgical emergency because of the haziness of the fat in and around the hernia and the trace fluid within the hernia proper. Here's just a couple more views of that. Here is nicely showing you the defect. Here it is on the sagittal view. There's the inflamed bowel. Just a really nice example. And here's a few more views. So you could see for the surgeon, this will be a challenge because it's a large hernia. There's also a large defect and the patient's rectus muscle uh, is not going to do well. It's very thinned out. You just can't over sew the muscle. This patient will get a mesh to help relieve that patient's hernia. Now, mesenteric ischemia is, um, again, a challenge, and one of the challenges is in this area of hernias. One of the things you really want to be careful about, and the surgeons are very careful, you want to operate perhaps too early than too late. It's very important when you see the hernia, again, when you see some haziness in the mesentery or around the bowel, when you see increased bowel enhancement, transition points with thickening or fluid, you really want to be very careful. Again, from the radiologist's perspective, you can see we just need to look at the various opportunities to make early diagnosis. Um, so again, the importance of CT in that regard is clearly shown in this article by Singa. So I mentioned in small bowel the differential diagnosis. We've looked at adhesions, which are number one, Hernia is number two, and number three is going to be tumors. Now, tumors can be primary in the bowel, or they can be secondary involvement. Here's an example of a patient who presented with uh, upper GI symptoms, and symptoms suggesting a gastric outlet or proximal bowel obstruction. And you can see the patient's duodenum is obstructed, but it's not a duodenal tumor. It's a tumor in the tail of the pancreas, which invaded the duodenum, causing obstruction. So sometimes tumors of the pancreas, they can obstruct in the duodenum second portion. They can obstruct more at the ligament of trites, as shown very nicely in this case. Here's a patient with a duodenal adenocarcinoma. Tumors, when they're small, may not obstruct, but when they get larger, they will obstruct. Here's a patient with a long segment tumor from the duodenum into the proximal jejunum, a classic appearance for adenocarcinoma of the duodenum. Very nicely shown on the coronal views. There's the dilated bowel. There's the transition point. So one of the things to realize, of course, when you look at bowel obstruction, it can be proximal, as in this case of a duodenal adenocarcinoma, or be very distal in some of the cases I showed you a few minutes ago in patients with inguinal hernias. And here again, very nicely showing you the transition in 3D. Again, very nice example of how those bowel loops look. And again, the importance of the coronal visualization. Here it's very nicely shown in the cinematic. 
dilated loop of bowel, lots of fluid, folds get thicker, there's the infiltration, very nicely shown there, or in this view as well. So again, the key is looking at this very, very carefully to pick up these patients' uh, site of obstruction. And in this case, I know it's a tumor. I think it's an adenocarcinoma. That's going to be the most common. In theory, you could be wrong, and perhaps it's a lymphoma, but typically the patient will get a biopsy before they get surgery. But again, in that region, adenocarcinoma, particularly with the appearance, is more likely. Lymphoma, on the other hand, often mesenteric mass, the so-called sandwich sign with the nodal uh, encasement of the patient's mesenteric vessels, large mass tracking down into the mesentery, very classic. Look at the encasement as you look at this case on these images of the vessels, which shows even better when you look at the coronal. The vessels are patent, but they're encased. And lymphoma often will simply push the bowel, though here it's causing dilatation of the proximal small bowel. Lymphoma, even when it gets very bulky, doesn't cause the extent of obstruction you might expect to see, but it does cause obstruction. And this is a very nice example of lymphoma causing small bowel obstruction. Here it is nicely shown on the cinematic rendering. Another example, dilated small bowel. The small bowel is thickened. What's the cause? Now, could this be simply a hernia? Could it be adhesions? Well, whatever is causing this obstruction is concerning because of the appearance of the bowel. I would worry perhaps about ischemia. While you look at the coronal view, there's a mass in the mesentery with calcification, and then you see the dilated loops of bowel. You see other areas of nodularity in the mesentery. And this is a great example of a carcinoid tumor with desmoplastic reaction with distal small bowel obstruction. Often the primary tumor in carcinoid may be hard to see, though we are doing better at seeing them, but surely you see the transition and you see the mass in the mesentery. The mesenteric masses cause a desmoplastic reaction, often encasing SMA or SMV. Also, the mesenteric masses will have calcification. Now, you can see calcification in things like sclerosing mesenteritis or treated lymphoma, but with carcinoid, the desmoplastic reaction tends to make it an easier diagnosis. Here again, showing you the look with cinematic rendering. Another example, small bowel obstruction. Here you see nodal masses, tumor around the patient's colon, implants on the omentum, ascites present. It's a pattern of carcinomatosis. If I only show you these images and I tell you it's a female, you think about ovarian carcinomatosis, but mucosal of the appendix, uh, patients with gastric cancer, patients with carcinoma of the colon, carcinoma of the stomach, all can give you this carcinomatosis. And this is a very nice example of carcinomatosis, what typically is considered pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, causing small bowel obstruction. So one of the presentations, of course, of tumors like ovarian cancer or any tumor which gives mesenteric implants or mental implants is going to be small bowel obstruction. So again, you can see in the coronal view how extensive this process is, all of the nodal involvement, all of the implants, the thickening on the ascites, classic pseudomyxoma peritonei, also very nicely shown on the cinematic rendered views. Another patient with symptoms of bowel obstruction and abdominal distension, this looks far worse than the prior case. Look at the caking along the omentum. That's, again, pseudomyxoma peritonei. Think of a number of things. Again, I mentioned mucosal of the appendix, ovarian carcinoma, gastric adenocarcinoma, common bile duct tumors, but there are many different possibilities, even things like primary peritoneal mesothelioma, though that's exceedingly rare. So patients with carcinomatosis can have displaced bowel as well as dilated bowel, as in this case. And this patient's um, mucinous tumor was due to a appendiceal lesion with a classic case of pseudomyxoma peritonei. So just a very important diagnosis. We often or sometimes can't always say what the cause of the pseudomyxoma peritonei is, but we can basically detect it, define it. Patients will get surgery, and even with surgery, sometimes the surgeon and then subsequently the pathologist are not sure where the primary of origin is. Now, 
Uh, appendiceal neoplasms are indeed interesting because we think of appendicitis as the main appendix process, but mucoceles of the appendix can give you these pseudomyxoma appearances, implants on the serosal surfaces, in the cavities. Occasionally, the implants will indeed uh, calcify. Implants in the pelvis, paracolic gutters, omentum, and liver capsule are just some of the places where this can occur. And here's another example. Carcinomatosis is what it looks like. Implants on the omentum, distension, bowel obstruction. And I show this case to keep you honest. Now, if I see this case on my desk, well, we don't have film, so on my computer, I'm saying pseudomyxoma peritonei, and I'm giving a differential diagnosis. If you show me this case in conference and you ask what else could this be, if it's not tumor, then I'm going to say TB. TB peritonitis, particularly in patients from Africa, classically Ethiopia, get a carcinomatosis type appearance of TB peritonitis. Just a wonderful uh, case we had. Again, it's unusual, but something to think about. But again, in the scheme of things, most of the time we see an appearance like this, it's going to be carcinomatosis. Now, one of the other things when you speak about tumors that causes obstruction is intersusceptions. Intersusceptions can be due to benign lesions like lipomas or in this case, lymphoma. When I see lymphoma, there's often multiple intersusceptions, as you can see here. Also, metastasis, like for melanoma, can give multiple intersusceptions. Neoplasms account for about 70% of intersusceptions in adults. Adult intersusception of the small intestine is usually caused by benign tumors, whereas intersusception of the large bowel is caused by malignant tumors. But it can be both ways. And we could talk about some of the causes of intersusception, which are listed here. But you know, we seem to be running out of time. Why don't I stop there and why don't we pick it up right here uh, after we take a short break. And with that, I'll see you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.